I am not one for camping. I simply just do not see the appeal. However, my daughter insisted that we go camping together, and I would do anything to spend more time with my daughter. So naturally, we went camping but in her backyard. Our backyard is pretty nice. It's fenced in and has a fire pit. However, on the other side of the fence is an endless forest of trees. Some nights, we hear animals out in the woods, nothing outside the ordinary. We set up camp inside our fence. We did this mainly so we could plug in a TV and watch TV while camping. Not exactly traditional camping, but it worked for me. Things started off great. We pitched the tent, inflated the air mattress, and started a fire out in our fire pit. This was actually kind of nice. This kind of camping was much different than the kind I had with my family growing up. We put out the fire early and went inside our tent to watch some TV. My daughter, being young, naturally wanted to watch Frozen. I sighed in frustration and agreed. It wasn't long into the movie before I was fast asleep. I assume it wasn't much longer before my daughter did the same. I woke up a couple hours later. My daughter was fast asleep inside her sleeping bag. The TV was still on. I was about to turn off the TV and go inside to use the bathroom, which is a huge perk camping in your backyard. But I was stopped by the sound of what sounded like an elk screeching out in the woods, just on the other side of the fence. Hmm, I thought. That sounded kind of close and kind of odd. I didn't think elk were nocturnal animals. I could be wrong. I was about to get up again when I heard the weird sound of something tampering with the fence. It sounded like the elk was rubbing against the fence, or trying to jump over. I know elk will sometimes rub their antlers on trees, but not normally a fence. I was kind of paralyzed by this. The brief thought of a burglar jumping in our backyard terrified me. At that moment, I was able to hear something successfully jumping over our fence. Now I was on full alert. I could hear the sounds of something walking around our backyard. It sounded like it was walking on all fours, but I could be wrong. This would, however, support my elk theory. The animal then walked over to our tent. I was able to tell due to the footsteps and I was able to hear heavy breathing. The breathing was not natural. It sounded as if someone was trying to breathe, but their lungs were filled with blood. The creature then started to circle our tent. I could see parts of the tent caving in, as if someone was pushing their hand against the canvas. This was terrifying. It definitely looked like a hand. Thankfully, my daughter was in the middle of the tent, and whoever was outside was not able to touch her. The creature then walked around to the front of the tent, and seemed to stumble across the extension cord coming from the TV. It began pulling on the cord, and the TV began to move. This snapped me out of my shock, and I immediately got up and unplugged the TV. The cord was quickly pulled out of the tent. I went over and hugged my daughter, doing my best to control my breathing. My heart was pounding outside of my chest. A part of me was glad that my daughter was still asleep. The creature then made its way closer to the front of the tent. That is when I began to see the zipper to the tent move. It was trying to get in. Again, I was able to hear the creature breathing so unnaturally. I did the only thing that I thought I could do at the time, and I just held the zipper closed. The creature eventually stopped and continued walking around the backyard. At one point, it sounded like the creature was on our deck. The creature definitely had hooves. It wasn't long before our automatic porch light turned on, casting a shadow of the creature on our tent. The outline was terrifying. Whatever it was, it was tall. It was lanky. The limbs looked bent. A part of me wanted to open the tent and peer outside to see whatever creature this was. But something told me that was a stupid idea. Thankfully, the porch light seemed to spook the creature off and it ran off in the backyard, jumping over our fence. I took this time to pick up my daughter and head inside. I moved quicker than normal and thankfully, my daughter didn't wake. I was able to open the door quickly and lock it behind me while holding my daughter. I set her down in her room on her bed, and we both spent the night inside. The next morning I woke up and went outside to clean up camp. I could see hoof prints around my backyard. The prints were circling our tent and all over the backyard. 
they had definitely belonged to a deer of some kind. Keep in mind, my backyard fence is about six feet tall. Not an easy jump for anyone. I just brushed it off as a weird encounter with a deer in my backyard. I was kind of impressed for the deer to be able to jump like that. Anyways, fast forward a week. I'm out by the fire pit, enjoying a nice beer. The fire pit is not too far from the fence. As I'm relaxing by the fire, I'm able to hear something on the other side of the fence. It's that breathing again. That disturbing breathing. I immediately hop up and try to look over the fence. By the time I get there, I'm only able to see something running off into the woods. It looked big. I then decide that I am done being outside, so I go put out the fire and head back in. I'm freaked out about everything, but I don't tell my wife. She gets spooked about everything. I spent the rest of the evening just hanging out and watching TV downstairs. I can hear my wife doing the dishes in the kitchen. She enjoys doing it and it helps her relax for some reason. Lucky me. Like most kitchen sinks, there's a window nearby that allows a full view of the backyard. As I'm relaxing and watching TV, I hear the shattering of dishes, followed by my wife saying, what the hell is that? She's pointing out the window to the backyard. I get up and glance to see what she's looking at and follow her finger. Standing in the backyard is only what I can describe as a demon. The creature was tall and pale, very long limbs. It had antlers, but had the face of a man. The creature seemed unaware that we were able to see him. It seemed to be sniffing around where I was sitting near the campfire. I did the only thing I thought I could do at the time and called the police. Before I was able to finish the call, the creature had jumped back over the fence and off into the woods. I made a report over the phone, but I did not recommend any officers coming out. The creature had left, so there was no point. After dealing with that and trying to calm down my wife, it was pretty late at night. I'm not sure what to call it. The only thing that comes to my mind is a demon of the forest. I'm pretty sure the creature that my wife and I saw was the same creature that was trying to get into the tent that one night. Whatever the creature was, it was now getting braver. My wife and I began waking up late at night. We began hearing sounds coming from our backyard. They were the sounds of that same scream with the lungs filled with blood. This creature was smart. It stood just far enough to where it would not turn on our automatic porch light, standing in the darkness of our backyard. At times, I would see what looked like red eyes peering back at me, but I can't be completely sure. We would waken to screams about every other night, each time the screams being closer and closer. I think one night, the creature was able to enter our home. I remember waking from a deep slumber, still very groggy and disoriented. My daughter leaves the bathroom light on, which is down the hall from our bedroom. Its dull light shines through the bottom of our doorway. Once I was awakened, I heard the sounds of what sounded like hooves coming up our wooden stairs. The footsteps went from the stairs to the front of my bedroom door. I could see the shadow underneath the door. I could hear the door handle slowly turning, but the door never opened. The creature then turned around and walked back down the stairs. For whatever reason, instead of getting up and making sure my house was cleared of whatever creature, I just went back to bed. I woke up the next morning and immediately checked on my daughter. She was okay. Whatever I had experienced the night before must have been a dream. That is until I went downstairs and saw the back door. It was wide open. I am a forest ranger and I cover one of the largest national parks in the United States. I cannot give you my station's name for obvious reasons. Quick backstory. I was recruited out of college by one of my professors who retired from the parks and worked part-time as an econ teacher at my college. He was a great man, but passed away a few years ago to cancer, unfortunately. I have been working at this location for about four years, but overall nine years in other locations. Like I said, I have been here for four years, but I still see and hear things that surprise me every day. For starters, this place is odd. It's unlike any forest I've ever encountered in my career. 
The forest has a perpetual, yet almost paranormal, thick fog. Once you leave the forest grounds, the sky clears for the most part. It's like an invisible boundary. This fog makes it very difficult to navigate, and if you are new to the area, you are bound to get lost. It's very strange. Another thing that is strange is instead of using standard weapons, we carry a heavy arsenal in our station. These aren't your typical rifles, but rather military grade fully automatic weapons. I have never seen this ever at any forest service station. I am told that the head ranger was good friends with the guy in the army, and because of that we got the hookup. Another excuse I've heard for these kind of weapons is that there is a lot of poaching in the forest. We have a lot of endangered animals in the forest and we need to protect them, but I don't know. Other forests I was stationed at, we typically just enforce this with heavy fines, but every place is different. Another thing that is very strange is that there is a highway-like road that goes through the part of the forest but doesn't exit, meaning that it leads somewhere in the forest. Now here's the weird part. Only people with military authorization are allowed to use this road. Forest rangers and other personnel are not allowed to use the road or even walk adjacent to it to see where it leads. Even talking about the road will lead you to being reassigned or terminated. Another thing that's weird about this forest is that there is a third party company that is in charge of taking care of any missing persons case inside the forest. This company doesn't even have a name, not even a logo that's associated with. We just call them on a special telephone that we have in our chief ranger's office. Needless to say, we're kept pretty busy throughout the year, helping campers find their campsites, catching illegal fishermen and hunters, you know, the usual. The strangest and somewhat terrifying thing about all of this is that no ranger is allowed out of the forest past 8am or before 6am. I have no explanation why this rule is in place, but it makes me and other rangers uneasy. It's as if something's out there and we need to protect ourselves during the night. Now that I've covered the backstory, let me tell you about my terrifying experience. It was Tuesday, around 6.30 a.m. The sun had yet to rise and the visibility was near non-existent. I was on a back trail with my four-wheeler, driving slowly not to wake any nearby campers that were sleeping. I have my four-wheeler lights on, plus a heavy-duty headlight I like to wear when I'm driving. This helps me see through the thick fog. Mornings are typically quiet due to the sun not being able to reach through the forest fog until about 8 a.m., but this morning was deathly quiet. There were no noises being made by any animals of any kind. No birds chirping, bugs buzzing. I didn't pay much attention to this since the low hum of the four-wheeler drowned out the silence. The lights on my four-wheeler then came across a campsite that instantly disturbed me. The campsite looked like a crime scene. The tent was shredded and blood covered the tent. The campsite was utterly destroyed. It looked like a bear had dragged someone across the campsite while bleeding everywhere. I didn't find any bodies. Other than the blood, there were no remnants of anyone. Technically, this event would be considered a missing persons case and the third party company would investigate. I was about to call it in, but I was perplexed by the situation. I had never seen so much blood before. I couldn't help but think that whatever creature did this was still here. That's when I noticed how quiet it was outside. I felt exposed. I went back to my four-wheeler and tore off in the direction of the main station, not caring about waking any of the other campers. I reached back in record time and called in the situation to the third-party company. They came quickly and immediately quarantined the campsite and any nearby campsites. They were in hazmat suits. Some of them were holding machine guns and making sure that no one could see what was going on. I was interviewed and told that what had happened was a pack of wolves had gotten hold of some campers that left out some food. This was interesting. I had worked here for four years and never seen or heard any wolves before. I had seen mountain lions and bears, but never wolves. By the time the interview had ended, it was 8.17 a.m. and the campsite was cleaned up. The other rangers were coming in from checking their respective sectors and asked me what had happened. I told them I couldn't say and not to worry about it. They seemed spooked since they could tell I was still recovering from seeing that horrific sight only hours before. This had been the first time I'd stumbled across anything like this in this forest. 
Apparently, the third-party company didn't seem phased, and it looked like business as usual for them. As I said before, the company was unnamed, and didn't have any logos, so I couldn't tell you what the name of the company was. We would see them roughly once a week or so, investigating or cleaning up campsites. Again, this was unique to this forest, and this forest alone. At 9am, we all met for a morning meeting. The chief ranger exited his office with the man that interviewed me, and met us all out in the meeting area. The man that interviewed me spoke first. He didn't identify himself, or who he was with, but thanked us for our cooperation and that new measures were going to be in place. The first being that curfew was now from 6pm till 9am, also that no one was allowed in or out of the campgrounds. If anyone tried to leave, that they were to be escorted back to their campsites until the investigation had ended. If they refused, then we had the legal right to detain them and place them inside our holding cells. Another change was that once curfew began, that we were to take turns guarding the perimeter of the ranger station, using lethal force against, and I quote, any creatures. The man was not specific as to what kind. I think this was by design. He then thanked us for our cooperation, and left. The chief ranger then spoke, and reconfirmed everything the man had said earlier. He made it clear that we were not to be alone and not to be out past curfew. The rest of the day was complete chaos. Most, if not all campers, were trying to leave the campgrounds. We had to escort them back to their campsites, save a handful of them that we ended up detaining. They had been spooked by the investigation and caught wind of what had happened. They all wanted to leave. And for that, I don't blame them. I did find it odd that we had to detain people from leaving the campgrounds. I can see why we wouldn't let in new campers, but not to let them out? That seemed kind of wrong. Throughout the day, we received reports of large wolves around the campsites. I took a couple of rangers with me out to the areas where the reports were called in from. We were armed with the fully automatic weapons and began looking for the wolves in the dense woods that were covered with the fog. The fog was thick and made any visibility near impossible. We did see a couple of tracks, but they were inconsistent. It would start off as wolf prints, but then gradually change into hoofs of some kind. My theory was that the hoof prints were older and harder, and it looked like the prints were changing, but were just old prints that hadn't rubbed away yet. It didn't make perfect sense, but that's what I went with. While looking for the wolves, we came across a figure standing in one of the paths. It looked like a young girl. She looked ill. Our visibility wasn't great, but it was clear that she was disoriented. Her hair was messy and had twigs in it. Her limbs looked bruised and broken. One of the junior rangers went over to assist, but she walked off the path away from us. The junior ranger followed her, assuming that she was scared of us since we had guns and that we were strangers to her. The ranger set aside his gun to comfort her and continued walking towards her. Suddenly, we heard a shriek coming from deep inside the forest, away from the girl. We all looked in the other direction, only for a moment, and looked back. The junior ranger was now nowhere in sight. What the hell? I said out loud. I readied out to the ranger, but no reply. I walked over to where he was last seen and picked up his gun. I kept within the sight of the other rangers, not daring to go further. Hmm, well, he knows his way back, I said. I walked back to the path, and I took the other rangers back to the ranger station. We get back to the station, and surprisingly enough, it's 5pm. Where did the time go? I wondered. I hope the junior ranger makes it back before curfew. It's only an hour away. The handful of rangers went inside and we got ready for curfew. We have rangers ready, standing on the balcony with spotlights and machine guns. Again, we aren't exactly sure what we're looking for, but we're told to shoot any creature within sight. I glance at my watch every five minutes or so, waiting on the junior ranger to arrive until 6 p.m. rolls around. We get inside the station, and I begin to worry what will happen over the night with the campers and rangers stuck outside. During the night, I am given the shift 2 to 4 in the morning to stand guard on the ranger station. I am accompanied with a fellow ranger named Gabe. He has been at the station for roughly the same amount of time I have been. We were well acquainted, and even hung outside of work a couple of times. Needless to say that my shift was somewhat enjoyable. Minus the fact that we were somewhat terrified of being outside on watch. Again, we did not know what we were looking for. Nothing happened the first hour. 
I worked the spotlight, and Gabe kept his aim with his weapon. We probably enjoyed ourselves too much and were distracted when we heard rustling in the woods, not too far from the station. I aimed the spotlight in the woods and saw the silhouette of a very large animal. The eyes were reflecting an eerie green color that looked haunting. The animal looked like a wolf, but with the mass of a bear. We were surprisingly not too concerned since we were safe from harm being on top of the station. Gabe took aim and shot twice, once clearly hitting the animal. Nothing happened. Gabe chuckled a nervous laugh. I did hit that thing, right? I agreed and Gabe fired again, but to the same effect. Finally, Gabe just let it rip and went full auto on the animal. By this time, more rangers emerged on top of the station. They were obviously trying to see what we were shooting at. Once Gabe finished the clip, the animal finally sprinted off, but to our horror, on only two legs. You could hear the other rangers gasp in terror at the ungodly sight of this unknown beast. By this time, all the rangers were talking and theorizing what we were looking at. After 15 minutes in the cold evening air, all the excitement died down and we were left to finish our shift with only Gabe and I. By the time we were done with our shift, the other rangers seemed worked up. Word had gone around about the creature in the woods. I tried to get as much sleep as I could before 9am, but to no avail. 9am came around and the curfew was lifted. The rangers were able to start their duties in the forest, although hesitantly. Most rangers either saw or heard the events last night, and they didn't want to meet the seemingly bulletproof werewolf. I was worried about the junior ranger that went missing yesterday, and I made sure to keep my eyes peeled while servicing the forest. I gathered a group of six rangers, and we loaded our guns on our four-wheelers and took off into the endless forest that surrounded us. We didn't have to drive very far to see that the creature made very easy prey of the campers that were forced to stay quarantined in the forest. The first campsite we reached had a camping trailer turned over. The campsite was destroyed. I jumped off my four-wheeler and readied my weapon. Other rangers followed me as we investigated the campsite for anyone that was hurt or needed medical attention. This campsite had a lingering odor that I can only describe as rotting meat. It was horrific and led me to believe that whoever was staying here was definitely dead. The site was covered in blood and the trail that led out looked like someone was being dragged. After a brief search at the campsite, we saw that no one was there. I decided that it wasn't safe for us to be out and we should return back to the station. As I was walking back to my four-wheeler, we all heard the sound of a screaming person, but it sounded so wrong. Have you ever tried to scream underwater? That's what it kind of sounded like at first, but it was accompanied with the sound of radio static. All of our attention was drawn towards the area where the sound was coming from, and to our horror, we saw what looked like three figures standing off in the fog of the forest. They were all obscured by the fog, but we were able to see what looked like antlers on people. What? The screams continued. Rather than investigate to see if the people were okay, I made the decision to take everyone back to the station for safety. I hopped on my four-wheeler and drove back with my fellow rangers with the screams of the people fading in the forest. That is until the screams were getting louder. We were being chased by these things and they were gaining on us. I was going full throttle and yet these creatures made ground. At one point, I could hear footsteps of something heavy making its way behind me. I was the second to last rider in our group and for a brief moment, I swear I could hear something heavily breathing behind me. A part of me wanted to look, but I knew if I looked, I would definitely die. The fear and curiosity was on the forefront of my mind, but I was too terrified to look. Finally, we were able to see what looked like the station just a couple of meters off the trail. By this time, the screams and sounds had stopped. We pulled into the station and I was able to see that the ranger behind me was missing. The ranger either went another way or something grabbed him out there. Something was actively picking off the rangers. Something is eating the campers in the campground. It seems that all we can do is try to survive. Whatever creatures were in the forest. We call in the trashed campsite to the third party company and we report the missing ranger. The chief ranger now catches wind of the two missing rangers and seems spooked. 
the company comes in as usual and pulls in with a full hazmat team as well as a full suited SWAT team that are wearing gas masks. The head guy from the company calls an impromptu meeting with all the staff and rangers on the campgrounds. The meeting is brief and hardly no information is shared about what is going on or what the creatures were. He then tells us that we are no longer allowed outside. We were to defend the ranger station at all costs. This meant that we were not allowed to open the doors to anyone unless it was him or another high-ranking military personnel who should be there in about three days. Essentially, we were being quarantined inside the ranger station for three days until the military is able to come and relieve us of the station. The man leaves and the chief ranger says a few words before the meeting ends. Look guys, this is not the first time something like this has happened. This is all pretty standard and we will get through this as long as we stay together and stay outside of the fog. The people that you see in the fog are no longer people. Don't be fooled if they try to speak to you. Shoot anything that won't come inside the spotlight. They hate the light. What? What was going on? What the hell does that even mean? I thought to myself. What did he mean by, they aren't people anymore? What was the thing that was out in the woods? What is going on with the people in the campsites? Why am I not getting any answers? The rest of the day, all of the rangers are posted up inside the station. Their weapons are pointed at the reinforced barriers on the doors and windows. The company cleaning up the sites began using flamethrowers on the crime scenes inside the campgrounds. I was able to see this since I was posted on the roof again with Ranger Gabe. It was clear that whatever was making these messes, they wanted to remove any evidence of it being alive. Night came quickly, mainly because we were all dreading it and this made time go by way faster. I was to take the late shift again from 4 to 6 a.m., but I wasn't paired with Gabe. I had Emily, who was a good ranger but was in her 40s and was thinking to transfer soon. She wasn't someone I could easily talk to, but was still a nice person. I tried my best to get them sleep before my shift, but once night came, we all heard the screams. Again, they sounded distorted and infused with static. This chilled me to the bone, since there were way more of these things out there. It sounded like a dozen or so, and they were all circling the station, just out of view of the spotlight. About every hour or so, we would hear shots fired, but nothing would come of it. 4 o'clock came and I had about 2 hours of sleep. I was exhausted. I was exhausted, but the adrenaline and the situation was keeping me awake. Emily and I perched on top of the station and Emily worked the spotlight. The light cut through the thick darkness and fog, providing a small beam of light in the dark void of the night. I was able to make out green eyes surrounding the station, but whenever the lights would shine in that direction, the creatures would fall back behind the dense trees that surrounded the station. About seven minutes into my shift and I saw a figure walk out from the trees about 50 yards away from the station. I aimed my machine gun at its center mass and had my finger ready to shoot when Emily shined the light on it to reveal that it was the junior ranger that went missing the day before. There's no way, I screamed as I aimed my gun away. The junior ranger looked like he was dragged behind a horse for three miles. His limbs were all broken, his neck was twisted, and his head was bent at a 90 degree angle. Rookie, I screamed. Are you okay? What happened? He didn't say anything. He just stood there as if he didn't hear me. Emily screamed at me, telling me to shoot him and shoot him now. I'm not going to shoot him, he's hurt, I responded defiantly. It's not him anymore, shoot him. I aimed down the sights to get a better look at him. The junior ranger had his mouth open as if he was about to say something. The sound of the horrific scream came out surprisingly at a loud volume. I was taken back by this and lost my aim for only a moment. I wasn't ready to shoot what looked like a fellow ranger. I aimed again and quickly unloaded my mag inside of him. Each shot clearly hitting with bits and chunks flying off, but he just stood there. I reloaded and went to aim again when I saw he was gone. What was left behind was a small puddle of black oily substance that smelled like the spoiled meat from earlier. Screeching now began from the forest and it got louder and louder. The creatures were a little bit more visible but still unclear. They seemed unfazed by our firepower and were ready to make a move on our station. We called down to the rest of the station and told them that we were on high alert. Every person was armed in less than a minute guarding an entryway of the station. 
We remained on top of the station, providing spotlight coverage for those below. We began to hear a mixture of screams from both the creatures and the rangers. It sounded as if the creatures were flanking on all sides and were trying to make it inside. More figures emerged from the forest, screeching while doing so. The sounds alone were enough to disorient and to terrify anyone that was nearby. The creatures were fast. It was almost as if our bullets were useless. Emily told me that all we had to do was to make it to sunrise and that we would be okay. At this rate things were going, I wasn't sure if that was possible. It sounded as if whatever those things were, were inside. There was still gunfire for the next 10 minutes or so. Then, there was an eerie silence that fell over the station. The rangers below had either ran out of bullets or, worse, the creatures had gotten them. Emily and I stayed on the roof, locking the only access point hatch preventing anything from getting to us. We still had some ammo and our spotlight, but somehow the creatures were able to find a fuse box inside, and all the power to the station went out. We were stranded on top of the station in complete darkness, surrounded by shape-shifting creatures that wanted to kill us. All we could do was to remain as silent as possible, hoping that the creatures were either satisfied with the people below, or they just forgot about us up top. We could see them in the darkness, with their green glowing eyes walking around, some on all fours, others upright like a person. The screeching didn't stop until the sun came up a few hours later. We waited a few hours for good measure, before slowly descending into the horrors that laid waiting for us. Just like the other campsites from the days earlier, the station was destroyed. Blood and body parts were everywhere, but there was never a full body that we could recognize from the mess. They were either unidentifiable or they were missing. It was clear that the only people left alive in the forest was Emily and I. I went to Radio and the company to tell them what had happened and called in reinforcements. They were there in record time and with a large convoy of people in hazmat suits and machine guns. We were questioned about the event that had happened the night before and we shared what we saw. They seemed not surprised at all and almost disappointed. The man interviewing us told us to follow him, so we did. We were able to follow him into a room, and he had us sign an incredibly long set of pages, saying that what we saw was intellectual property of the United States government, and that disclosing any information to anyone would result in the charge of treason, and most likely our death sentence. I signed the papers. I knew if I didn't, I would be shot right then and there. Why was the government trying to cover this up? What had happened in the forest those couple of nights? What were those creatures? My father told me a story once. I'll never forget it, for a few reasons. I think it's the first story he's ever told me as a child. It's also the story of how my grandfather had died. But honestly, that isn't the reason. You hear stories on TV. Or sometimes, you overhear something in public. People talk about ghosts or aliens and you think to yourself, that isn't real, they're making it up or they're mistaken, they're crazy, something like that. You can't just believe it. That is, until something happens to you. Something that brings it all together, connects the dots in a way that you didn't think of before. Maybe it happened to you or maybe you hear about the same story again and again from different people. It doesn't take long for the world to become a lot bigger than you thought it was. As I said, this is a story my father told me, but I never believed it, even though he swore up and down that it was true. It wasn't until I started clicking around the internet that I started to believe. I started to hear other stories, just like the one my father told me. It didn't take me long to believe after that. My father never used the internet in his life. He wouldn't know what the online community had called it. When he chose to call it something other than it or that thing, he called it a skinwalker, after an old Cherokee tale his grandfather had told him. I'll tell you the story, the way he told it to me. We were out hunting one night in the woods, surrounding the dairy farm in Ohio, where we lived at the time. We were tracking coyotes. We'd kill them for 50 bucks a skin. They would kill calves sometimes. We'd do it every night because we needed the money. Sometimes while we were out, we'd come on a deer and kill it. Our landlord didn't mind and it would feed her family for a few nights and save us some money. Anyway, we were done making our rounds and headed home, walking because we didn't have a four-wheeler or a car back then. We'd cut through the woods, 
That's when we came upon it. Blood. Everywhere. Splattered on trees, in the grass, in the creek, everywhere. At first, we figured it was a pack of coyotes. We'd seen how, sometimes, they weren't able to scavenge for whatever reason. They'd start hunting deer or cattle, out of desperation. The worst was when they had bred feral dogs, but this wasn't like that. You see, when a pack of dogs, wolves, or coyotes attack anything, they do it right. They'll pick one off that's weak, sick, or old, or just small. They'll hunt it, draw it into a corner or someplace they can't get out of, and they'll run it right into the biggest one, the alpha. That deer will never see the alpha. It might hear it, but it won't see it. All of a sudden, its throat will be torn out, and it'll drop dead. It's quick, and it's clean, but that's not what happened here. Something had come upon a group of deer. Coyotes won't attack a group. Wolves wouldn't either. They'd get too much of a fight. There were three, I think. Three bodies, just torn apart. You'd see a head or a torso here, a leg there. Predators don't do that. They don't leave scraps behind. Whatever had done this, hadn't done it for food. It had done it for fun. But we didn't know that at the time, of course. We just saw a bunch of carcasses and figured that it was something we had to take care of. I remember my dad telling me to go home, that he thought it was the work of a pack of feral dogs. But I wasn't leaving him. I surely wasn't hiking through the two miles of woods, alone, in the dark, with nothing but a twenty-two and a pocket knife. I was only thirteen at the time, so a twenty-two rifle was the only gun I got. Dad had the shotgun, and I wasn't going anywhere without him. It took me a while to convince him. But finally, we were able to track whatever did that. It wasn't hard, either. We just followed the blood. Either that thing bled a deer before it got away, or it dragged one for a mile. I don't know. What I do know is that I'd never seen my dad that scared before. We started hearing the most horrible sounds. Now, I've been in the woods a lot in my life, and I've been all over the world. But I've never heard noises like I heard that night. I heard things. Screaming. I heard foxes, deers, rabbits, raccoons, and birds, all of them afraid of something and hightailing it. Keep in mind, this is maybe 12 or 1 in the morning, except for the fox and some birds. Nothing was supposed to be awake at that hour, but they weren't just awake, mind you. They were on the run. That night I saw a flock of birds flying straight into trees, trying to escape something. We came upon a pack of coyotes and nearly shot a couple thinking they had their eyes on us. But then, we saw that they were running in from someone, nothing towards us. They didn't even notice us, and went right past. Then some deer did the same. Then some rabbits, squirrels, and foxes. Even a couple of wild hawks. These critters were supposed to be hunting each other, and the only thing they cared about was getting far away as possible. We should have put two and two together. That maybe whatever we were tracking wasn't something we were supposed to see, and wasn't something that we could kill. To this day, I don't know why we just didn't go home. I guess we are curious. I think that was my dad's nature, to go towards trouble, to fight. And being aware of the things my father did during the war, I figured it was best to stay by his side. We finally reached the open valley. It was normally a soy field, but it wasn't in season, so it was just flat dirt. That's when we saw the tracks. Animals fleeing the forest had leveled everything in their path. But where the deer's blood was... Nothing had take a single step. It was like whatever was responsible had left it for us to find. The tracks were shallow. Whatever it was could not have weighed more than just a hundred pounds. But that didn't mean much. A bobcat weighing forty pounds soaking wet could tear your throat out if you aren't careful. The fact that this thing was on the lighter side just meant it was probably quick. It was going to be tough to hit. So we followed the tracks and it didn't take us long to find where they led. There was an old schoolhouse that sits on top of a hill, half of it been ripped out by a tornado, but no one lived there, not for a long time. Sometimes we caught homeless people up there, or drug addicts looking for a safe place to shoot up. We figured maybe that was it, maybe it was just some sick kid riding a high, but we didn't think that for long. When we got within 50 yards, we heard a noise, a sort of a screech made up of two different sounds. One was high pitched, and the other was a low growl. It was making both sounds at the same time, if that makes any sense. We approached within 20 yards, and we heard another sound, different this time. I remember thinking it sounded like paper being torn apart while someone was swinging water back and forth in a bucket. Dad looked at me, 
knelt down and whispered. He told me that I had to stay behind him because we were about to corner our prey. Any animal will fight when it's cornered, especially a predator. But we can tell by the tracks that there was only one. He tells me it's probably a single feral dog, most likely rabbit. The plan, he said, was to sneak up on it while it was eating, shoot it, and then just keep shooting it until it didn't move anymore, then slit its throat. If it got to Dad, it was my job to shoot or stab it until it got off of him. So he walked up with me right behind him, just a tad to his side so I could see what it was. I wished to this day I hadn't. It was leaning over a carcass, tearing off its flesh and throwing it. There was blood all over the brick, glistening in the moonlight. It was pale white and looked like a man, but not quite human. It had arms and legs like ours, but it sat like a monkey, hunched over. Its hands weren't normal. It had long fingers with claws at the end. So we saw that, and my dad hesitated. He wasn't about to fire at a person, so he cleared his throat trying to get it to turn around. I swear, all the sounds just ceased in an instant. I never heard true silence before that, and never again afterwards. But for two seconds, nothing made any noise, and I meant nothing. This made it all the louder when the thing turned around, made a shell cry, and pounced on my dad. He got a shot off. I think he missed. If he hit it, it didn't phase it at all. But it was on him, tearing entire parts of him off. I started shooting it with my 22 point blank, but the thing barely bled at all. I got off five rounds, and then I started hitting it with the butt of the gun. It didn't even budge or register that I was even there. It was clawing at my dad, removing whole chunks of his flesh. It started on his torso, peeling off the skin of his chest, and then it moved up. It tore out his throat, ripped his nose clean off, and gouged out his eyes. Then it scalped him and started digging in. I stood there, helpless, as it ripped off the bottom half of his jaw, the little bones, and the tube in his neck, and then his ribs. I don't exactly remember what had happened, but somehow my dad's knife ended up in the thing's shoulder and my dad, or what was left of him, that is, ended up on my back. I was running, and my god, I was going faster than I'd ever run before or after. The thing was following me. I ended up back in the forest, opposite the woods we started in. I was heading towards my landlord's house because it was the closest thing to help nearby, but even that was a half mile away. All the while, I could hear the thing screeching and moaning. I heard branches crackling and getting thrown around. It was cracking so loud and so often that it sounded like someone was taking an axe to every single tree I passed, but I never looked back. Not once. The thought didn't even cross my mind. Finally, I tripped and fell in some gravel. I looked up to see my landlord and a bunch of his buddies drinking around a campfire. I screamed and cried, and they came over. I told them to call an ambulance, and my landlord looked at me and said something I'll never forget. What is that on your back? He asked me. Just as the words left his mouth, it dawned on him without me saying a word. It was one of those terrible flannel shirts my dad wore everywhere, he realized. It was damn near all that was left of my dad, aside of a bit of my father's head and torso. Absolutely nothing below the waist. Suddenly, we heard it. The screeching. My landlord grabbed me, causing me to drop whatever was left of my dad on the ground. I was fighting him, crying because I thought we could still save him, somehow. But the truth is, my dad had been gone well before I ever picked him up. And all I'd done was carry his corpse back home. My landlord had to pick me up and throw me inside before I would go with them. He and his buddies, all of us went inside together, and they locked the doors and we got the guns. The landlord asked me, what happened, what happened? but I didn't know what to tell him. He'd pieced enough of it together to understand that there was something dangerous out there. All the lights in the house were on, and someone called the cops. They would get there as soon as they could, they said, but that meant at least 15 minutes. We looked outside and saw it walk from the front of the fire they'd made. No one knew what it was. One of them said it looked like an ape. Suddenly, something came crashing through the window. We all fired at it, but realized it wasn't the thing. No. It was my landlord's dog. Well, his body anyway. His head and legs were missing. We had just started pushing things in front of the door and windows to form a barricade when we heard something in the garage. I remember that one of his friends saying that the doors were open. We heard metal and glass being ripped and smashed. We dragged the couch and TV in front of the door to the garage for added measure. 
It banged around some more, but then it got quiet, not silent like it was before. We could hear it move around some, and the guys were talking, making sure their guns were ready. Someone handed me a pistol. No sooner I cocked the hammer back when we heard something shatter upstairs. Then, we heard it screech again, except this time it was louder, and it didn't echo and fade out. Because, it was inside. We all rushed to that one door that led upstairs, and we got to it just in time, as the thing did. It opened it just a bit, and four or five men slammed into it. It managed to get its hand through. Someone with a shotgun took care of that. Put the barrel right to its wrist and pulled the trigger. Blew its hand clean off. That only pissed it off, though. It started shoving the door, clawing. We were on the other side, pushing as best as we could, and it was on the other, doing the same. The wood wasn't going to hold, so someone told us to keep our heads down. Suddenly, the top half of the door was gone, and my ears were ringing. There were splinters everywhere. Two or three of them had just unloaded on top of the door. I don't really know where it went after that. The police got there. I was still glued to what was left of the door. The sun was up before they pried me loose. They put me in a hospital for a while. While I was there, a whole lot of people talked to me, but I didn't respond. Not for a long, long time. When I got back home, I got a job for the landlord, working on the farm. We didn't talk much, not about the thing, but I signed up for the army when I was 19, and he sat me down to drink some scotch as a send-off. I asked him right away what the police told him. The story that they went with was that it was a wild animal, probably a wolf or maybe a bear that had migrated north. I asked him how they could see that when they had the hand. He looked at me stunned. He told me that the hand never made it back to the station. The cop who had it in his car got into a wreck, drove into a tree and died on impact. The hand was never found, likely taken by an animal. The cops, when they would acknowledge the hand existed at all, said it was simply the paw of a bear that resembled a man's hand. I never talked to the landlord again. He went missing while I was in basic training, and no one ever saw him again. There were rumors that he owed some people some money and skipped town, but I don't think it was that simple. I currently live in a very old town. The town is out in the middle of nowhere and only has a few thousand people. However, during the summer, we do get a good amount of tourists coming by our town, mainly because of our gas stations that are so close to the highway. To me, it seems a bit sad that the nicest thing that my town offers is our gas stations. I am currently living on the outskirts of this town, just off of a dirt road that no one goes on. The dirt road is shared by me and an old woman that I refer to as Grandma Dixie. Grandma Dixie's husband passed away a few years ago due to old age. Because of this, she now lives alone in her house. Grandma Dixie is a good family friend of ours. I make sure to stop by at least twice a day just to make sure that she's okay. Dixie is pretty old, but her house is much older. It has gotten to the point to where it might actually be a safety concern to live in that house. I've tried a couple of times to try to get her to come live with me, but her house just has too many items and too many memories for her just to leave that hole behind. One of the biggest frustrations with that house is her back door. The back door's latch is broken so the back door will never stay shut. I made sure to prop up a cinder block against the door to keep it shut, but sometimes Dixie will take the cinder block to use it as a step stool and forgets to put it back. The dirt road that we live on is surrounded by trees. During the nighttime, it does get quite spooky. It gets extremely difficult to see. This is mainly due to the density of the trees, not allowing any light to pass through. There's also a phenomenon that I often refer to as night sounds. I am aware that there are a lot of nocturnal animals that live in these woods, but some of the sounds that we hear are very supernatural. On some nights, you will hear crying or weeping coming from deep inside the woods. On more startling nights, you can hear what sound like screams just coming from outside my house. I've asked Dixie about the sounds and if she's ever heard them. She always tells me that it's never good to talk about it, and she never tells me why. This makes me curious but not to the point to where I actually investigate, but I always have it in the back of my mind. I remember one evening I went over to Grandma Dixie's house. It was the evening and we watched Jeopardy, during which Grandma Dixie loves her wine, so by the time of Double Jeopardy comes around, she's pretty tipsy. I decided that this night would be a perfect night to ask her about the screaming out in the woods. 
Instead of her normally pushing it off, she actually opened up about what was actually happening. She told me about the woods being cursed by these creatures, but she didn't name them. She seemed too afraid, which was very unlike her. She then gave me a brief history of the town, which was unjustifiably taken by force from the natives. What she was saying actually made sense to me. It made sense why the town was so small and that no one really wanted to stay for too long. She then went into detail a little bit more about the creatures, how that they were able to mimic sounds and lure people out in the woods. I began to get uneasy at this topic. It was getting late and I still had to walk back home. I double checked Dixie's house and made sure all the doors and windows were closed. I double checked that back door and made sure that the cinder block was securely in place. As I made my way outside, I instantly felt eyes on me. As if somehow I alerted every predator to my location. I quickly walked down the dirt road while seemingly noticing every noise and every movement. It's not like I haven't done this a million times before. It was just different and I really can't explain why. My house was now within eyesight when I heard a weird sound coming from the woods. It was like a low growl that slowly transformed into something more familiar. The sound was coming from behind me, somewhat close to Dixie's house. For a very brief moment, I thought it was Dixie trying to call me back as if I forgot something at her house, which has actually happened before. But when I turned around, I finally realized that the sound was actually coming from deep inside the woods nowhere near where Dixie would be. The sounds were very familiar and sounded like Dixie, but again, the sounds were deep in the woods, nowhere near where she would actually be at this time of night. I turned back around and I sprinted towards my house. Whatever it was making those sounds stopped, and I began to hear movement coming from behind me. It sounded like something very big moving through the woods at a very fast pace. Whatever the thing was, it was definitely gaining on me, but thankfully, I had a head start. I was able to reach my house and open and close my door before whatever it was reached me. Once the door closed behind me, I heard a loud thud and scratching, as if it was a very large dog trying to get in. The scratching quickly stopped and I was met with silence. That's when I heard whatever it was begin to mimic Dixie again. It was very convincing. If I'd not just been chased by this creature, I would have probably opened the door and would have gotten mauled by this thing. I tried peering outside, but I didn't see anything. Whatever this thing was, it was smart to stay out of my line of sight. I went around my house, making sure all my doors and windows were securely locked. I then placed my trusty shotgun next to my bed, just in case I had any nightly visitors. The night was uneventful. Despite being chased through the woods, I didn't have anything else strange happen to me that evening. I got up early the next morning for some reason I had forgotten what had happened the night before. I got up and made breakfast. As I was leaving my house for work, I noticed that my front door had huge scratches on the front of it, and then the memories of the night before came flooding back to me. I then hopped in my car and made my way off to work. While driving on the dirt road, I passed Dixie's house. I did a quick glance over, as I normally did, and to my surprise, the front door was hanging on its hinges as if something broke into the house. I immediately pulled over into her driveway. I walked up to the front of the house, stopping on the front porch. I peered into the house as best I could while calling her name. The inside of the house was quite dark, but I could still see that the furniture was flipped over. Something definitely went down last night. I was just about to step into the house when I heard something calling my name from the inside. It sounded much like Dixie, except her voice was very staticky and hoarse, as if she was at a concert screaming her lungs out the night before, but obviously that wasn't the case. I yelled back into the dark house, Hey Dixie, you okay? There was a very long pause. She finally responded with a very calm yes, and then she invited me inside. Something was off. I politely declined her invitation and I told her that I had to get to work, which was actually true. Something told me inside my gut that whatever it was talking to me wasn't Dixie. I got out of there as quickly as I could without raising any suspicions. Once I was in town, I called the police telling them what I had experienced. They seemed almost uninterested, thinking that it was probably a prank. I then drove to work starting my long shift. About an hour into my shift, I got a phone call back from the police, 
telling me that they had responded to my call and they had a couple questions for me. I told my boss that the police needed me and I drove down to the police station. Once I was at the station, the police would begin to question me for the next two hours. Due to the severity of the tone and the types of questions, I was able to deduce that Dixie was now missing, if not worse. Right before I left the police station, the police told me what they thought had happened. They thought that the back door of Dixie's house was left open and that a wolf or a bobcat had gotten in. Due to the blood at the scene, they thought that Dixie was most likely gone, but they never found a body, which I think is kind of strange. However, I didn't tell the police about my experience with that thing chasing me in the woods. Due to the investigation taking place on my dirt road, the police offered to put me in a motel for the meantime. I obviously declined, and I drove back later that night once my shift was done. By that time, the police had left, but there was still caution tape all around her house. I slowed my car just a bit as I was peering inside, but I never did stop. Whatever had happened at Dixie's house had freaked me out and I decided to put my house up for sale. But whatever it was that happened at Dixie's house must have gotten around town because I got no offers on my house. Unfortunately, I still live in that house today and every time I drive by Dixie's house, I can't help but think what actually happened that night. When I was younger, I used to work for a plumbing company down in Arizona. I got calls all over the city and I would travel in my company van. We sometimes got calls from the Navajo reservation, which we weren't actually allowed to visit. I don't know why. I asked my boss about this a couple times and he always gave me random answers. The main answer that I would always get was that our car insurance wouldn't be covered out there if anything happened. I did drive a rather big van that had lots of equipment in it, so I guess it kind of made sense. I was finally able to get a direct answer from my boss one night. When I was over at his place and we were drinking beers, I then asked him the same question I've always been asking. He was pretty drunk and pretty open about talking about anything, so he told me this story. About 15 years ago, before he was the boss, he was actually a plumber for the company. The company's policy back then was pretty flexible, so he would take a couple contracts down on the reservations. One day on the reservation, he took a contract with a man that claimed to be a very dark magic man. My boss at the time didn't really care what this meant, he just wanted to get paid. The dark magic man was quite old. His English was quite poor as well, which made talking quite difficult. He got a call from him one day saying that there was something in his basement that he needed to fix. Upon arriving, he realized that the man wasn't actually at the house, but there was a note on the door. The note read in very poor English, Leak in basement. Don't look around. My boss was a little bit weirded out by this, but he figured that he was already here and he'd driven all this way. He entered the home and made his way into the basement. The basement was naturally unfinished, adding to the creep factor. Before he reached the bottom, he was able to hear a drip coming from inside the basement, which made finding the leaky pipe quite easy. He walked up to the pipe and began working. While he was working, he began to hear sounds coming from inside the basement. It sounded like something wooden being scratched. At first he thought it was just a pet, maybe a dog. He paid it no mind and continued working. While he was working, he heard the scratching again. This time he heard a small voice coming from behind a wooden door, asking for help. He found the door in the corner of the room that was heavily bolted shut. The door was made out of wood, but had three padlocks on it. At first my boss thought maybe he came across a child trafficker or a kidnapper of some kind. The voice coming from behind the door seemed young and feminine. My boss got up quickly and ran to the door, asking if the child was okay. The child said that she was trapped behind the door and that the man in the house was keeping her there forever. My boss did all he could to try to open the door, but to no avail. He then looked around the basement, looking for any set of keys that could maybe go to the door. To his surprise, he found a set of keys that looked like they belonged to the door. He tried the keys on the lock, and sure enough, they worked. Quick note, my boss's name is Steve. Steve was unlocking the last lock on the door when the voice behind the door said, Thank you, Steve. The voice was still feminine and young, but it seemed off. How did the little girl know his name? He stopped unlocking the door and took a step back. Something was way off. Steve then decided to look under the door, something that he says that he regrets doing. He says what he saw on the other side of the door was evil incarnated. He only looked briefly, but what he saw was disturbing. Standing by the door on the other side was a huge creature. 
The creature's feet were huge claws. Once he saw this, the creature began to scream and shake the door violently. Steve thought that the door was going to break down. He turned around immediately, running up the stairs, leaving his tools behind. Before he reached the top of the stairs, the door holding the creature back broke down. The creature was now free. Steve was able to get out of the basement and the house safely. He got in his van and drove off. He told me that that was the scariest event that he had ever been through, and that if the creature actually caught him, he probably would have been dead. So that's the actual reason why we're not allowed on the reservation. We've never spoken about this particular event, not even among ourselves, after it happened. It was with my friends Ben and Ryan, and myself going camping into the woods, like we used to do when we got a weekend off, or at least used to do, before this. In general, we try to go to new places. There was this one forest in particular situated two hours away from our city that we've been told about. We've been putting it off for a while because it was said to be dangerous, packed with wild animals that would attack campers often. Ben, in his usual part of trying to be a badass, said he would take out his shotgun and we'd be safe. Ryan was a bit of a wimp, but he agreed, so we drove there as soon as we were able to when we had a free weekend. We got there by mid-afternoon. After we set up camp and the night was beginning to set in, we decided to go out for a walk. We secured our stuff and Ben took out his shotgun, in case any animals approached us, and we started following a small path that got deeper into the woods. Walks in the dark like these would always relax me, but this time I was starting to feel uneasy. Something was off. About half an hour of walking, we started to hear noises getting closer to us. They sounded like footsteps of several big creatures closing in on us, but to this day I swear I could also hear soft whispers beneath the noises. Feeling like cornered animals, in total panic, we began running back through the path that we had come on. During this, I somehow lost Ben and Ryan, and we could not even see their flashlights in the distance. I kept on, running crapless. At some point, I ran past an old house, which seemed to have suffered a fire. The windows were boarded up, but the door seemed to be half open. Suddenly, I heard something coming from inside. Terrified at first, I froze, but then I realized it was actually Ryan, calling for me to come inside. I was doubtful at first, for some reason, but as soon as I heard the animal sounds coming closer to me, I bolted into the house and closed the door. I lifted my flashlight to look around, and there was Ryan. I pointed the light to his eyes, but he didn't seem to react much to it. In fact, he seemed really calm, which was odd for him. Let's stay here for now, he said, in a relaxed tone of voice. Those things out there could be dangerous. Now I was worried about Ben, but remember that worst case scenario he had a shotgun, ready if anything attacked him. I took a deep breath and started looking around the room. The few chairs that were laying on the floor looked charred, and in one corner of the room, there was a pile of sticks with a bunch of stones scattered around them. All of a sudden, we hear Ben's gun go off twice. I stood there paralyzed, as every other sound in the forest stopped. I glanced briefly at Ryan, and he was just looking at me completely quiet. I was about to say something when suddenly someone started banging on the door. Ryan immediately grabbed my shoulders and said, don't open that door, it could be one of those things. I started walking towards the door and he insisted, don't do it, they're gonna kill us. This really unsettled me, but I was afraid it could be Ben, who had just shot one of those wild animals and was looking for shelter. I grabbed on the metal door handle and took a deep breath. And as Ryan was still talking behind me, I opened the door. A cold chill ran down my spine. Standing there in front of me was Ryan. It didn't sink in at first as he was saying, Hey man, did you hear Ben's gun go off too? I think we needed to find him and get the hell out of there. I babbled something incomprehensible and slowly turned around, pointing my flashlight all over the room. Nobody was there. When the light reached the corner of the room, I realized what I had been looking at earlier. It was a pile of bones, and around them, forming a circle, were a bunch of skulls. Human skulls. We ran off as fast as we could, and found Ben near the campsite. When he saw us, he was pale, and did not say a word. We got in my truck and drove off, and we left the place, leaving all of our stuff behind. On the way back, after a long silence, I asked Ben what he shot at. 
Some of those things came from behind in the trees and attacked me. I shot them down. Ben, what were those things? It... It was you guys. I killed you both back there. The rest of the way back, nobody spoke a word. We never saw Ben again. The story I'm about to tell you is quite startling. A couple of years ago, back when I lived in the woods, I had a very close call with something coming into my house. At that time, I was working the late shift down at the local gas station, which meant I got off around 11 o'clock. Whenever I'd get off, it would be pitch black out, making my drive into the woods all the more creepy. I lived about 20 minutes away, 10 of which were in the woods. At this time, I had no neighbors, but I did have a college roommate of mine that would often swing by from time to time. One evening, when I was pulling into my driveway, I was shocked to see that my front door was wide open. I got out of my car, hesitantly, using my cell phone as a flashlight. The first thing that came into my mind was that someone broke into my house, but then I realized how unlikely that really was. It was probably my old college roommate forgetting to lock the door and a gust of wind must have blown it open. This wouldn't be the first time he has done something like this. As I got closer to my door, I was able to detect a smell that I can't really describe, but nonetheless, it was terrible and very unique. The door being opened and the smell made me feel very uneasy. I slowly entered my darkened home with great caution, with the feeling that at any moment, something could jump out and attack me. Thankfully, once I turned on the lights, it revealed that there was nothing there. I then entered my home, closing the door behind me and locking it. I did a quick walk through my house, just making sure that there was nothing else lurking in the shadows. Thankfully my search yielded no results. I then took a shower and got ready for bed. Instead of falling asleep quickly, like I normally do, I was kept awake with the thought that there was still something hiding in my house. After about 30 minutes, I fell asleep. A couple hours later, I slowly wake up. I wasn't alerted by a bad dream or by a sound, but rather a smell. The exact smell that was there when my door was wide open. I slowly get to my feet and make my way over to the door. As I'm walking, I can hear sounds coming from downstairs. It sounds like something is thrashing around, looking for something. I idiotically make my way towards the stairs, turning on the hallway light as I go. Once I turn on the hallway light, the sound downstairs immediately stops. I had unknowingly made my presence known. The very brief silence is immediately replaced by more thrashing heading towards the stairs. I decided that I didn't want to wait to see what it was that was making the noise downstairs, so I immediately turned tail and ran back to my room. The way my hallway is set up upstairs is that there is a bedroom, a bathroom, and then my room. I was able to enter my room and close the door behind me while locking it before the thing was able to make it up to the top of the stairs. Thankfully, whatever it was, decided to enter the other room first instead of mine. This gave me enough time to hide in the crawl space in my closet. The crawl space was pretty well hidden. You wouldn't be able to find it unless you moved around some clothes. I could hear the door to my room being opened and something very large walking in my room. I could hear furniture being moved, items being thrown. The worst part about all of this was the smell. The smell was absolutely terrible and stronger than ever. At this moment, it finally dawned on me to call 911, but when I went to do so, I couldn't find my cell phone. I must have left it behind in all the rush. I then heard the closet door being opened and hearing something very large stepping inside. A part of me wanted to peer out and see the intruder that was in my home, but I didn't want to risk being seen. I sat quietly as the intruder rummaged around my closet, thankfully not finding me. I was able to hear the intruder's breathing. It sounded as if whatever the person had bad asthma or a smoking problem because they were hacking and wheezing. It definitely sounded unnatural. The intruder left my closet and went back downstairs. At this moment, I took it upon myself to find my cell phone and call 911. Throughout the call, I was able to hear the intruder downstairs. It was pacing around and moving items as if it was looking for something or someone. 
I did my best throughout the call to stay quiet while telling the dispatch where I was and what was happening. They told me to go back and hide in the closet, which I did, and wait for the police to come. By the time they arrived, whoever was in my house was long gone. I didn't leave the closet until the police came to get me. I could tell that they were very surprised to see me okay, and they kept asking me over and over again if I was hurt, which I obviously wasn't. The police escorted me out of my home and out into one of the cruisers. While walking out of my home, I was able to see how messy my house was, and it was very trashed. Something I noticed that was interesting was what it looked like blood all over my furniture. Why was there blood on my furniture, I thought. The red substance was all over my home, and I was quite concerned as to what it was. I guess that explains why the police thought I was injured. I went outside and sat in one of the cruisers. The police gave me the option to either stay in my house or come down to the precinct and stay the night there. I obviously chose the second option. Fast forward two years. I had moved from my house that I was once living in, and I was living in the other part of town. For whatever reason, I was driving near my old house near the woods, and something on the road caught my eye. There was something pale hunched over in the middle of the road. I was about 50 yards away, and I couldn't really make out the details of what was in the middle of the road. But there was something I did recognize. The smell. It was the very same smell I smelled that night that intruder entered my home, and that experience was brought to my mind. I slowly inched closer with my car. I was wanting a better look at whatever it was in the middle of the road. At first, I thought it was a person. I could only see its back, but the closer I got, the more I realized that it wasn't. Its limbs and arms were terribly distorted, its legs bent backwards like a goat, and the thing was pretty tall even though it was hunched over. Whenever I was able to see it perfectly, it was as if it knew, and it stood up. The creature was about eight feet tall. Its skin looked old and wrinkly. Everything about it looked human, except for its head. Its head was that of a deer or maybe an elk, and all the skin and flesh had withered away from it. I was only able to see it perfectly for a few seconds before it ran off into the woods, but the very image of this thing will haunt me forever. Could this creature be the thing that entered my home that one evening, or maybe these two events are unrelated? Regardless, ever since then, I never go near the woods at night. This story was told to me in 2009. I was a freshman in high school, and it was Halloween. Halloween just happens to be my favorite holiday. Anyways, I walk into my English class, which was my last period for the day. My eccentric teacher had all of the lights off, with a stool in the middle of the room. On the stool was a single candle that was lit. Next to the candle was a bowl of candy with our favorite candies inside. My teacher, who was kind of a goofball, was wearing a cool witch hat. Once everyone sat down inside the class, my teacher held the candle and sat down on the stool. She told us that instead of doing classwork today, we were going to share the scariest story that we knew in return for some candy. My teacher started the stories with the famous urban legend with the man with the hook for a hand. Most of my classmates had heard that story before, but nonetheless, we enjoyed hearing it again. My classmates then took turns telling their stories. Some stories were spooky, while others were kind of lame, but none of them compared to one story that I heard. The story came from one of the redneck kids in my class. He was mostly quiet and didn't really talk much. That's why we were kind of surprised that he wanted to share one of the stories. Anyways, here's his story. His father and his uncle both had a cabin that they would use to go hunting up in the winter. The cabin was up north and kind of up in the hills. To get to the cabin, you'd have to drive about two hours deep into the woods, most of which was on a dirt road. Off the dirt road a little bit was about a 15 minute hike to the cabin. The cabin was pretty secluded. He said that his family uses the cabin mainly for hunting. The story then took a weird turn when the father and the uncle in the story returned for the evening after a long day of hunting. As they were walking down one of the hills to get to the cabin, the uncle in the story noticed a light coming from the cabin. Not just one light, but multiple. The lights were torches. There was a cult performing a ritual just outside the cabin. The dad and the uncle took position behind a tree and aimed their guns down at the cult. The cult was chanting something, 
but they couldn't really understand what it was. After a few minutes of watching what was happening, they noticed a large figure step within the view of the colt. It was this strange monster, unlike anyone had ever seen. It was tall and pale, and had very long talons for fingers. The head of the creature looked like a goat, due to its horns. When the creature got close enough to the colt, the chanting stopped. The creature appeared to be talking to the cult members. At that very moment, out of nowhere, the uncle opens fire on this creature and hits it a couple times. The father does the same. The father and the uncle only aim at the creature and not the cult members. The creature lets out this terrible scream and takes off into the night. The rest of the cult members run off into the woods, never to return. The father and the uncle didn't stay the night in the cabin. Instead, they took off down the trail and made it back to their cars. The whole time, they were able to hear the creature screaming off into the distance. The guy's father asked the uncle, Why did you shoot at the creature? And the uncle responded, I'm pretty sure that was the devil. The entire classroom's mouths were wide open with amazement. That was one heck of a story, and I think about it often. What is really out in the woods? My name is Lexi, and in 2007, my parents sent me to a summer camp up in Alaska. This camp was famous for its fun adventures, and I really wanted to go. I get there the first day, and the camp is everything I wanted it to be. The food was great, the scenery was amazing, and I made tons of friends. However, I was caught by surprise about the bear protocol. The bear protocol is pretty much what it sounds like. When any camper sees a bear, they're supposed to run to this tower and hit this button. That sounds the siren for the rest of the camp. Once you hear the siren, you are supposed to go to the nearest building and wait inside. Alaska has its fair share of bears, but the bears typically stay away from the camp, as long as there's no food out. Anyways, here's where things get spooky. My group was coming back from a canoe trip down at the lake. Camp counselors had to shuttle us down there in trucks, five at a time. There were 20 of us that day, so the camp counselor had to make four trips. Each trip took about 10 minutes or so, there and back. Once we were all down at the lake, we were then able to go canoeing and fishing. Near the end of the day, the camp counselor blew his whistle, which meant for all of us to meet back at the truck. He loaded five campers in the truck and took off down the trail. Instead of being gone for 10 minutes, he was gone for 30. When the counselor finally returned, we saw that the front end of the truck was completely mangled and covered in blood. He apologized for the weight and told us that on his way up there that he accidentally hit a moose, but for some reason he seemed very panicked about it. And then I remembered what they said about food being left out. That moose would have been a huge meal for the bears. I waited with my friends as the counselor took another group of five back to camp. At this time it was starting to get dark and me and my friends were getting nervous. We began to look at the tree line, looking for any signs of bears or any creatures that might have eaten the moose. While the counselor was away, we began to hear a sound that was very familiar. It was the sound of the bear alarm. The anxiety that we were feeling before now turned into a full-on panic. We were literally sitting ducks with nowhere to hide. All that we could do was wait on our counselor to come back. The counselor eventually came and we all packed into the truck. We felt somewhat safe in the truck, knowing that the bears couldn't get us inside. But my camp counselor told us not to look outside the windows on the drive back. I thought this to be strange, and it made me nervous thinking about it. Why wouldn't the camp counselor want us looking out the windows? What was he hiding? Some of the campers began to cry. I was pretty close to tears myself. But I did as he asked, and I looked away from the windows. Halfway through the drive back up, the counselor slammed on the brakes. I knew that we weren't back yet, and that we were still on that dirt trail. Against the counselor's command, I looked out the window to see what was going on. On the dirt path, I could see the moose, and that there was something standing over it, but it wasn't a bear. There was a pale creature hunched over the body of the moose. I could tell that the creature was very tall, despite it being hunched over, due to its limbs being very long. I didn't get a great look at it, because the counselor then took off down the dirt road. I could tell that he was startled. He kept checking the rearview mirror, seeing if that thing followed us, but it didn't. 
We got back to camp not much later. Everyone was inside the dining hall. The bear alarm was still blaring. Initially, I didn't tell anyone what I saw, mainly because I couldn't believe it. Maybe I imagined it. Maybe the way the headlights were shining on the animal made it look strange. I was trying to talk myself out of what I saw in order to make sense of everything. That night, all the counselors held a special meeting with all the campers. They told us that due to there being a bear nearby, that we had the option to either stay another week or to go home. Naturally, I opted to leave. The counselors contacted my parents and I went home the next day. I still couldn't get the image out of my mind of that creature. I got home and the summer continued as normal. Two weeks passed and I almost completely forgot about the creature at the campsite. Until one day, my father came up to me randomly, telling me some startling news. He told me that the camp I was just at had a bear attack, and that two campers went missing. He told me that he was really proud of me that I was able to make an adult decision to come home early. About a month later, they found the two bodies of the missing campers. Now normally, I would write this off as a bear attack, but the two bodies that they found were found in trees. It is possible that a bear could have done that, but it doesn't seem likely to me. I think whatever that creature was that I saw that night had something to do with it.